So I want to thank you all for coming here tonight. I realize this is not the biggest draw in the city tonight. The Red Sox are that, I think. But we have a really interesting race here, which is the Smith Vocational Candidates Race. We have five candidates for Smith, three spots in Smith Vocational Agricultural High School. Smith Vocational and Agricultural High School trustees. And there are only three spots. So um, we'll get to them in just a minute. I want to thank, first of all, Bridge Street School, which allows us to use this space. NCTV, which provides live video, recorded video coverage, which will be shown live on, in, not live, recorded on NCTV on Saturday and Sunday nights at 8 p.m. So if you know somebody who, somebody says something worth remembering, tell your friends to check it out. Saturday and Sunday nights at 8 p.m. on NCTV. Um, I want to thank the Board of the Ward 3 Neighbor Association um, and the candidates themselves. We are so lucky in this community to have people who care about these obscure institutions. And I don't mean in any way to denigrate Smith Vocational High School. But we, you know, we really, we're glad to have them here tonight. So, and I also want to thank the board, the Ward 3 Neighborhood Association, many of whose members are here tonight. And I want to thank Jerry Butler, who's the past president of the Ward 3 Neighborhood Association, who's going to moderate tonight's forum. So here's Mr. Jerry Butler. He will tell you the ground rules. Thank you. We're going to try to keep this as simple as possible and keep it moving rather quickly. Uh, the five candidates for the Smith Board of Trustees will each get a two-minute opening statement. We will ask questions. I'll have one minute to answer. And we will have a two-minute closing statement. Uh, Fred Zimnock from our, the board will be the timekeeper. Denise Quenneville will have signs that she will hold up to let you know when you have to stop. Uh, so we're going to try to keep this very simple. Um, I will ask questions and I'll ask if anybody in the audience wants to ask a question. So you'll have an opportunity to do so and hopefully we'll get at some of the underlying issues that um, probably are important, uh, will play an important role in making people's decision on who they're going to vote for. So let's start with the introductory statements and we'll start with Mr. Kaley. Good evening. Uh, I want to thank the Ward 3 Association for the opportunity to invite me here this evening to address any questions, to be able to give information about Smith's Vocational Agriculture and High School. Uh, in my opening statement, I just want to say that I'm involved with following a legacy. And the legacy was that my father, James K. Hilling, the former mayor of the city of Northampton in the 50s, was, of course, served on the board of Smith's Vocational School as a trustee. My brother John Lester K. Hilling served on the board of Smith's School as a trustee. And then I had an opportunity when the city of Northampton asked me to fulfill the term of Mr. David Bourbon. Mr. Bourbon passed away during when he was coming up for re-election and the fellow trustees and the uh, mayor, the city council, asked me to fulfill that term. So I did so gladly, and I want to appreciate again uh, being able to address you tonight. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Patton. Uh, good evening, folks. Again, as uh, Mike did, I wish to thank Ward 3 for having this little uh, pay to take. Uh, I came into this town from the Boston area back in uh, 1978, and I started teaching at Smith School, and I taught until 2000. I was there 23 years, uh, 16 of them as a department head data of data processing, the rest of the time in academia. Uh, teaching computers. Uh, I retired. I was out for approximately one year be before I went totally insane. <laughs> and uh, I then had an opportunity to fill a spot uh, of a person that was leaving because she had con re uh, contact <coughs> cancer and she wanted to get step away. So I took her spot, 
and I've been on the board now for uh, five terms. And it's, uh, it's basically, uh, I'll call it the love of my life. It keeps me going, it keeps me involved. My son has gone through the school, and I'm still very involved with it. And I guess that's about the best thing I can say. Thank you. Mr. Fitzgerald? Uh, thank you, Jerry. Um, I would like to also thank the Ward 3 committee for having this forum tonight, for everyone showing up, uh, anyone at home, and for uh, all of our uh, other candidates for local office who have shown up tonight. Um, I've been involved with Smith School for nearly 60 years. Um, my family's home uh, abuts the farm, and I can see it from my house. Um, the fields were a delightful playground in my childhood, and uh, seeing the rhythm of agriculture uh, has had a profound effect on me. Um, the protection and full utilization of uh, this priceless and irreplaceable legacy of uh, farmland um, is always a primary focus with me, um, and will remain so. Um, I got involved in some school um, out of interest for the farm and uh, protecting the land, but over my 10 years, five terms as an elected trustee, I have really grown to love Smith School, uh, to thrive on the energy that the students, the, the faculty, uh, the staff bring to the school. It's a, a really uh, can-do, positive attitude, and uh, we teach people some valuable and really indispensable skills that are often overlooked. Uh, and I'm proud to say I'm a, a hands-on trustee at a hands-on school. Um, we oversee the, dyna the dynamics of running 14 trade shops, um, prioritizing utilization of uh, scarce resources, um, reviewing the curriculum and educational materials, um, and also maintaining uh, campus. Our newest building was built in 1979, uh, so that's also an ongoing fight. Um, as a trustee, I'd like to informally meet with the administration. Uh, Mr. Lynn? Hi. First of all, I'd like to thank the Ward 3 uh, Association for putting this on. Uh, my association with Smith School started about 45 years ago when I first came to this region from Goddard College. And my wife's brother, who owned a 600-acre dairy farm in Plainfield, Mass., had gone to the school, the first time I'd ever heard of it. Uh, <clears throat> when uh, the second time I really got involved with the school was when I found out that my wife's grandfather had built the hay barn in 1927. He had been a carpentry instructor at the school. He got to know him real well. And uh, <clears throat> as I pursued a trade that I was involved in, I uh, got to know more and more about the school through people that I worked with throughout the trades in the valley, and uh, eventually I became a teacher at the school in 1984. Um, I worked there for uh, 18 years. I worked both in the secondary division of the school, which is the high school that we all know of, and in the adult education and in the post-secondary education component of the school. I'm very concerned about this school because as a national leader, in vocational education. I was the representative for 16 Northeast states. Uh, I spent nearly 20 years in Washington, walking the halls of Congress. We even got an award for Kennedy, Senator Kennedy uh, because of his outstanding work in the field of, of vocational education. He was a strong proponent of that. <clears throat> but across the board, I've been all over the country. I've seen what works in vocational education and I've seen what I believe doesn't, wouldn't work. Uh, and I believe that what I can bring to the school is a strong background in vocational education, curriculum building, the things the school needs, finding the funding. I was the, uh, a Perkins member of the uh, Perkins uh, Grant Foundation that the state had. At the time, it was $75 million worth of grants. Mr. Wolf? Thanks. Um, Ward 3, thank you very much. I live in Ward 3, so I come to your events and appreciate them. And uh, at 
He mentioned David Borbeau also from Ward 3. And a big part of my inspiration for running for the Board of Trustees is this missing element that we lost when David Borbeau was no longer on the board. I think Mike Kaling brought a lot of energy and a lot of intelligence um, and effective uh, trusteeship to the board. But there was something that David had, a vision of a renewable, sustainable economy, of um, bringing those aspects to the curriculum and the school, and of uniting the town and the trades together in a way that I think is meaningful, and that I think we're, we, are, we may or may not be aware that we're facing uh, some tension between the school and the mayor in terms of governance. And I think this is going to get negotiated, and I think that we need more of an accommodating view of what really will work and finding a plan that really will work for the school and the town. I've been working there for six years until recently as the uh, assistant technology coordinator. In other words, I was the computer guy, system administrator. So I interfaced with every one of the 14 shops, all the academic programs, all the offices, and I saw how the school works from the inside and out, and I loved every minute there and have a lot of second thoughts about the fact that I chose to leave but it made it possible for me to do this. I'd like to come to this board and bring, let's call it some youth, some vision for the future. And these guys have done a very good job, but I think for four years we've been in something of a holding pattern. And so the building hasn't moved forward that was envisioned for agriculture. Some of shops could be developed that are more forward looking. And I think the superintendent has the idea of what those could be and it could happen. So I'd appreciate being on here. I appreciate Mr. Fitzgerald explaining the many details this board oversees. And I'd like to be part of all that. Thank you. Uh, first question, the one that I assume my own soon was going to get asked, but we'll start with Mr. Cotton. Should Smith Vocational High School merge with the Northampton Public Schools, please indicate yes or no and why. The answer is no. <laughs> uh, emphatically. Uh, first thing, uh, the will of all of us met states that, and this is what the school is based upon states that there are three elected members of that are elected by the town they are called superintendents of smith school that's the old name uh it is in the will the will is what started the function of the school itself and uh it is a hundred year old trust in order to make any changes in smith school governance it will have to go to court. So uh, in order to uh, do that, you would have to, uh, there's one method of, uh, you would have to take to uh, get into that. Otherwise, it would be uh, the fourth time that the will's been challenged. Right now, it's been challenged three times, and Smith School's always come out on top. So with that, I'll leave. Mr. Fitzgerald? Thank you. Um, I also believe that Smith School should remain independent. Um, it is essentially uh, an independent, independent financially now. The uh, vast majority of our funding comes from grants and uh, from tuition from the sending towns. Um, the school has always had a special mission of uh, dealing with hands-on students in a variety of technical trades, uh, which are a mystery. Uh, to most of us. Um, if it were to be taken over by the school, I think many of the uh, of the money that uh, the mayor is saying comes to the city would, uh, comes to the school would be uh, the same because, for example, there's $800,000 of health care costs. That would remain the same. Um, we are the custodians of uh, several funds that were left to the school to support its mission. And we also need to maintain our farmland that was uh, given to us in the past. Mr. Lynn? Uh, the answer is uh, I would not uh, like to see the school folded into the Northampton school system. And that's because this school is actually, I'm amazed, this school is a national landmark. And it's not a national landmark that you put a bronze plaque on. This is a living organism. This school has created thousands of tradespeople, thousands of business owners, not only in Northampton, but throughout the full counties that it serviced in its history, 108 years of the school alone. But it's an institution that 
actually historically played a big role in American education. Through this school came the project method. Through this school actually came what we call progressive education. This is the kind of school that was developed and through this school's history, John Dewey, the great American philosopher and educator, named the association that all of the teachers that are involved in vocational education call it the American Vocational Association. So yes or no is the wrong question. Um, everybody up here is going to say no for the very obvious reason that the mayor hasn't presented any plan to do with this at all. He just wants his money back. We can't give him the money back because we need to run the school. All these trustees have a responsibility to keep the school at its best, which requires funding it at its best. The state has, however, said in various ways that something does have to happen, that the city has to meet its net school spending, or a change has to be made in the law. And it might go to court, as it's been mentioned, it's gone to court several times, but where it really happens is in the Commonwealth, in the, in the state legislature. If the legislators decide to make a change in Smith Smith's governance, that's what will happen, and then there might be a court case. So you have to look at whether it's going to be under a superintendent of schools who's never run a vocational school at all, which would certainly be true of any of the three candidates I saw today, or whether it would be a, a charter school, which is quite possible that we could charter Smith Oak. It's a charter school right now that's owned by a municipality, probably unique in all the world. Or it could be a regional vocational district. And that, honestly, is what I would like to see the most and probably the least likely to happen because the constituency isn't there. But it's been discussed before in the 90s. If we found two other towns and agreed to a vocational district, we could have a, an independent vocational district with a superintendent without having to go to the charter school and get this kind of state funding we need to run a good school. Uh, Mr. Haley? <coughs> Thank you. Uh, <coughs> being on the board for uh, the period of time that I've been on it, it's been a learning process. During the learning process, it goes back to when I was a student there, and I've watched the school come along and watch my peers graduate, go into business for themselves, go into business for others, and have a job. <coughs> when people talk today about using their head and their hands, that's a vocational education. And for the separation, to try and take and put this fine school into the city coffers, into the city's hands, into the city's uh, overseeing, when somebody needs money, whether it's going to be for an English teacher or a, a, a new piece of machinery for the machine shop, I'm concerned of what would happen. We need that equipment to educate these children, and it's important that that be the goal. I'd like to just follow up with a question that's sort of related, and it is, um, can you folks uh, tell us about some of the creative ways you think Smith, Smith Vogue and the Northampton Public Schools could partner to educate our city's students? <coughs> and we'll start with Mr. Fitzgerald. Thank you, Jerry. I'm uh, choking under pressure here, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the ways would be perhaps to um, share uh, classes to bring uh, students from Northampton High School uh, to Smith School perhaps for um, one day classes. Uh, I'm not sure how that would work out administratively. Um, Mr. Lynn? Well, this has been done once before and it didn't work in the past. And it, and it has to do with the, the way that you scheduled everything. Uh, in a vocational school, there is an allotted time, usually 50% for shop. And that's really where the students learn their skills. It's a vocation, in Nashville, there's a vocational school that has a music program. And I know that everybody's probably heard of the music program. Uh, at the school, the specialized school in New York City, but uh, the whole idea that you can practice a trade or a craft in a, a very short period of time, as in an in example, an industrial arts program, doesn't make sense when you're trying to develop a trade. <coughs> you want to have somebody that's able to accomplish a break job at 100% level, not at 80%, not at 95%. You want somebody to be able to do something you're asking them to do a, a task that really requires they have the kind of skills 
that are only developed in a school where they have 50% shot time. And that's a real structural point as far as vocational schools go. Uh, when President Clinton was the governor of Arkansas, I remember he was very proud of the vocational program they had in the state. So at the high school level, it's really hard to see those synergies because as has been mentioned, we have a split schedule where we're in a voc shop one week and we're in academic shop <coughs> the other week. Already a challenge for teachers to regain the attention of their academic students. Already a challenge for the vocational teacher to keep the flow going in learning of the trade. So to add high schoolers in, probably a difficult synergy. Similarly, to travel back and forth just even that mile takes up time of your day. So again, not that meaningful to me. But I can see synergies in lower grades coming to Smith Vogue more often, making trips to view how a plumbing shop works, trips to the farm on specific learning projects, science projects. I can see an expanded shop, an uh, environmental science shop, or if we have expanded health technology, where younger students could come and benefit in synergistic ways from learning from older students who are in those shops, actively in the shops teaching younger students about their trades, which would also benefit the school, which honestly needs its enrollment to grow. And one of the things that Northampton often says to us, despite the fact that they don't like to pay per pupil spending, is that they want us to take more of their kids. There's 10 or 12 kids a year that don't meet our entrance requirements. We'd like them to meet the entrance requirements too. Maybe we can do that if we meet them in the fourth or fifth or sixth grade instead of in the eighth grade. Mr. Paley? <coughs> That's a great question, Gary, and, and I think the reason it's a great question is because we have just been named a level one school, Smith School. We are rated the number, one of the number one high schools in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. We don't need to turn on and le learn from the city of Northampton school system. We are at a higher level right now than the city of Northampton. So the thing is that the independent school system is giving the academics for them to either go on and with their trade or they can go right into a two or four year college leaving Smith School and be whatever they want to be. Mr. Patton? I, I, I'm in cleanup this trip. Okay. Well, to begin with, uh, Smith Volk has to handle both sides of the coin. As a vocational school, you have the academic side, you have the vocational side. The high school is 100% academic. Now, if you wish to expand your knowledge in uh, art, in uh, music, in other venues such as that, certain languages, you shouldn't be at Smith School because we don't have that availability. Our availability is that we have to teach what the same as that the high school has to teach as far as the basics, but we have to do it in half the time. So certain things get lost, such as music and uh, things of that nature. The other half, on the other hand, we are showing people how to be the plumbers and the <coughs> carpenters that you will be hiring over the next 10 years. Think about that. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? Joan? I was interested in that comment you made about level one. I read it in the, in the newspaper. No and I, I wonder if you could explain more what actually that rating entails. Because I, I was sort of surprised to see um, Northampton High School was at level three. So I was just interested in how that, um, what that really signifies. Well, uh, excuse me, uh, questions have to be asked of the whole panel, yes. okay? Yes, so I, everyone will get a chance right. to respond, okay? All right. So, so I guess I'm, I'm looking at the, uh, the academic excellence of Smith School. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We are so gifted right now. Uh, we went out and had a search committee that put together uh, and he's sitting in the audience tonight. Uh, Mr. Jeffrey Peterson is our superintendent of schools. Jeff came in with a raise your hand, Jeff. So he, he's right next to you. <laughs> so he uh, he had the opportunity when he first came to school to look at the first day of school in regards to what he wanted to have done. And the opportunity was that he restructured the whole school immediately. He moved the offices around and he made himself available to everybody. And having done that, 
the students had access to them, the teachers had access, the instructors had access, and what he concentrated on was the MCAS scores. And what he concentrated on is what these students needed to have after a four-year period to graduate to be able to pass a test. We have the uh, NEAS people in there right now at the school doing an accreditation, and I'll explain more later. Mr. Cotton? Yes. Uh, I'll pick up on what Mike has just said. We, we get constant, if we have groups come in on a constant basis, always checking. Every school does, and they do down high school too. Uh, it's a matter of uh, who does the best job, and, and the MCAS, they want all your students to be proficient. That's the goal. Uh, in defense of the high school, which is not really my position, but in defense of the high school, their uh, level is based upon the lowest level given to a school within their range. The, the, that, that happens to be, I believe, a, one of the elementary schools. I'm not sure. Okay? So that's their, it, that degrades their level. All right, so that's why their level is lower. We are one school. We are doing our level best, and we have people that care and give extra time to have it happen. Mr. Fitzgerald? Oh, thank you very much, Jerry. Um, also, I believe the new uh, superintendent, as well as our board, has been stressing uh, the integration of academic uh, classes in math <coughs> and English and transferring them over into uh, shop work. Um, and it is important um, to emphasize really that the Smith School students are on two tracks. They're taking the same, meeting the same testing requirements as a kid in college prep course. Uh, who's going to go to Harvard and also uh, learns a trade, uh, sometimes entailing uh, great danger if you do it uh, wrong, such as uh, electricity. Um, we're very proud of our uh, number one rating and we'll keep it that way. Yeah, I, from what I can see at the school, there have been a lot of changes made by the new superintendent, and I perceive those as having some effect. But I have to also admit that over the course of many years, this school has been gearing up for uh, teaching the MCAS. And uh, I remember uh, back when I was at the school, uh, we had... Uh, an enormous amount of time devoted to working on MCAS points. Uh, and to take it one step further, uh, I think that, I think that the, the students uh, from, I know some of the students, I've talked to some of the students, and they seem really impressed with the present administration. And they've been through two different administrations at this point. Mr. Wolf? So I'm going to take a much less optimistic view of the level one thing. Um, it's about a single cohort. It's about data-driven reform, and it's about MCAS scores. This is a single cohort that moved to level one. That's about their training from K through 10, all the years they had. The two, two math teachers and the principal who might have been largely responsible for the last three years of, of advancement at smith Bow are gone, have been replaced with very qualified people, I'm sure. But a single year at level one, it's not like you're one of the best schools. It means you're no longer under the state's treatment center. It means that you're now performing at an acceptable level. Level one is a good thing. Smith folk made progress for years and they achieved level one from level three. This is very good. But it's not like we're one of the best in, this, in the Commonwealth as a result of that. We may be one of the best as a result of other things. But being level one just means we're performing at an adequate level and it means that one cohort did well on a, ma on a 10th grade ma MCAS score. We need to re replicate that every year and I hope that we do. Um, next question. Um, as you look into the future for Smith Vogue, what things do you think deserve more emphasis at the school and which should receive less emphasis and why? And I guess we start with Mr. Lynn. Thank you for that one. Uh, <laughs> having been at the school for a long period of time, being the last instructor at the school to teach at GCC, to uh, teach for the operating engineers, to teach the adult education program, to have one of the last postgraduate uh, students in the school, postgraduate be meaning a, 
a young adult who's graduated from an academic high school and then decided to learn a trade. <clears throat> I think that the thing that Smith School needs most right now is to develop an adult education program and reinstate it, to uh, reinstate the postgraduate program along with the secondary uh, division that they have now. And I think that by doing that, we will be giving back to the community uh, in many ways, uh, training people, giving people the opportunity to see a trade or, or learn some trade or technique that they would have never thought that would have been available to them. And also, right now in this country, there's a big... Sorry. I don't have time. <laughs> One minute, I know. It's always going to be tough. Um, and I'm not grateful for this question. I, I can't see the things I want to uh, de-emphasize at Smith Book very well. It seems like Smith Book's emphasis is mostly in the right place, and there's some additional emphasis that's probably needed. Um, again, I invoked David Bourbeau before. I'd like to see a very vibrant farm, and in this environment, farming means CSAs, it means developing produce, it means selling to market, selling flowers and selling vegetables, and I'd like to see that kind of production happening at Smith Folk, which would mean summertime students coming to work on the farm and going to market with their product, and that's something I'd very much like to see, so that's an emphasis, but there's also a focus on health technology, which is a really growing field, which brings a lot of science to bear, it helps your scores, it helps your students get jobs, these are jobs that are meaningful in the marketplace. And so health technology is something that I think should be vastly expanded, and I think it's a plan that's in place. It's not a new idea from me. Um, there aren't things we should de-emphasize. I mean, I'm not a football fan, but that seems to be doing a good thing for the kids, so. Mr. Kaling? <clears throat> I'd like to say that, uh, in regards to Denny's remarks, that uh, I was at a, a dinner at Smith School uh, with the New England Association of schools and colleges group that is in doing the accreditation I spoke about earlier. And they put on a meal, culinary arts. Our students stood out there and it was as fine a meal as the Clarion or the Hotel Northampton could put on. Not only were they talented and professional, but the beef came from our school. The, the, the cattle that you see in the field when you're driving down Locust Street, we grow them, we send them out, and they come back and we utilize everything that we can with lamb, chickens, and the uh, beef. And I'm proud of that in regards to an emphasis on our culinary arts. That is number one. And I invite everybody to come up for lunch that we have. We serve lunch three days a week up there. And I'd love to have you come and view the school and have dinner or lunch. Mr. Cotton? We'd all like to applaud that answer. <laughs> To be honest with you, I kind of lost track when I was listening to Mike, but it, it is true. We do an awful lot of interreaction. We do a lot of interreaction uh, with the city. Well, many of the things you see that go on uh, on a daily basis within the city are done at Smith School, such as the flowers. You go downtown, ever see that big white truck? It says Smith School on it. Those kids in the hard hats. They're out there because they're from Smith. They just took down a tree at the courthouse. Wait a minute, I'm supposed to get, have a tree company do that? No, the kids did that, and they were proud to do it. In fact, I believe they were down there when they replanted, when they planted the replacement. This is what that school does. Your, uh, your police department, every cruiser for nine months is flushed through some, some vote school. I don't know which one. Mm -hmm. I have to stop. Mr. Fitzgerald? Uh, thank you. Well, for the future, I think it's important to keep in mind that we do have to balance 14 shops at present and perhaps mm -hmm. other new shops uh, in the future. Um, I certainly will yield to no one in this room or in this city and uh, my, uh, my love and concern for the Smith School farm and the property uh, which we hold, it's not as easy as saying, well, we'll just start growing vegetables. We'll get people there day and night and on weekends. Uh, it is first and foremost a secondary high school. And to that end, uh, that is our first duty is to our students. Uh, again, I would like to see more use uh, made of the farm and um, have spoken of that my entire 10 years as a trustee. Um, but again, 
we have other, other trades, and that is one of the most difficult parts of being a trustee for the schools that there are so many legitimate needs and um, so few resources to meet them. Um, and I really don't see how, uh, how just changing the governance of the school or <clears throat> kind of, you know, we, we are doing all we can to uh, reach out to the community with all of our, our agricultural shops and our trade shops. Question from the audience. Um, Joel? Yeah, I, I'm not sure this is exactly appropriate, but many of us keep reading about how other countries around the world are getting way ahead of us in technology, how their students are coming out of schools, and they are much more sophisticated than our students. And we run into a shortage, this is an event, computer technology, these kinds of things. To what extent do you all ready, or will you be preparing students, maybe they still have to go to at least two years of college when they leave the vocational school. But what are you doing to help us catch up to Singapore and to Finland and to the Scandinavian countries and Germany and France and everybody else? Thank goodness this is my question. <laughs> because it's, pre, it's pre answered. Smith Vogue has an amazing pre engineering program, the Project Lead the Way program. It's a national curriculum that we buy. And, uh, and supply. It has all kinds of robotics elements. It has design engineering elements in it. It, it teaches kids the principles of engineering. Then it teaches them hands-on engineering projects. They build things they, they, that they've designed. They learn telemetry. They learn all kinds of aspects of engineering through this Project Lead the Boy program. So Smith has had that program in place, I think, all of my tenure there. So that's six years, and I think another two years before that. It was, there was one teacher who really took it to heart. There have been three or four teachers doing it now. I know the current principal would like to see every student in the school go through this program. So it's a real focus to have engineering taught at the school level. And in the manufacturing department, we also have people learning 3D CAD design separate from Project Lead, where there are two complete 3D CAD design programs that go on. And that stuff is also passed on through the carpentry program. They have a computer, whatever, CNC routing, um, so that they have computer-aided machinery there. So there's all kinds of things going on in Smith Book on that exact line. It's a great question. And uh, it's one that I look out as coming out from the school in 1964 to today and look at those accomplishments. Um, last week we had uh, Representative Smitty Pignatelli out of uh, Pittsfield come down and he toured the school. And one of the things we talked about is education. Uh, Matt Malone, who is the head of education, is coming in November 5th. And we are, have them as guests at our school. And he, uh, and Mr. Pignatelli, talked about exactly what you said and said, how come the advancement? And we realized we have to get on into the grammar school. And there's not too many young people that come home and sit on their mother's lap and say, I want to be a body man. And uh, so the thing is, I think they'd have a heart attack if they did that. But at the same time, exposure of coming along to be a machinist, to be involved in the future of uh, the country, the school, it has to start at a younger age. And that's where we're missing the boat, and that's where we have the challenges that other countries are educating their children younger. Thank you. Mr. Cotton? Uh, yes. We had a teacher that was over in Germany, uh, he, a teacher of auto body. He was able to view or visit a trade school over there. They go to school just about all year round. And then, where we have a co-op for our juniors and seniors, that's week on, week off. In other words, they go to work rather than the trade time. Over there, uh, he was saying that the, uh, some of the pupils that were in trade schools over there spend six months working in manufacturing. So he was talking about what can it work for Porsche. And that's how they learn. They are still involved at the school, but they, the uh, cooperative program over there makes ours look silly. Ours meaning that we have in this country. Because they take time to make a master person. We, what we do is we make a good apprentice so that they can go on themselves and, and educate themselves and work up through their uh, groups 
to be a master mechanic or to be a master plumber or a master carpenter. But it's a, it's a long time to get there. It's not an easy trip. Mr. Fitzgerald? Well, thank you. Uh, that's a very good question, sir, and I appreciate you asking it. Um, some of our shops, notably our manufacturing tech shop, uh, is very up to date. Um, it would be great to expand um, to, to serve a different student base. Unlike Europe, I think we do have probably more funding issues. I, I don't think as a society we value the, uh, the trades, the manual trades or the technical trades as much as we should. And I think that's uh, one of the reasons uh, why we should enhance Smith School's reputation further throughout the community is uh, to make people aware that we, we do provide that level of training and where we would provide uh, more training as, as different fields emerge. Similarly, um, all of our trades, plumbing, electrical, carpentry, all um, meet up-to-date uh, code requirements. So they do, in that end, uh, all of our shops uh, try to keep up in, in a basic way. Um, again, as uh, Denny mentioned, the project Lead the Way, the Future Farmers of America are... Mr. Lynn? Well, first of all, <clears throat> I went to Brooklyn Technical High School. It's the high school with the largest number of Nobel laureates that have graduated from it. I saw a really uh, an outstanding educa engineering education at that school. Uh, Smith School has managed to do the very same thing. And by that I mean this. Right in this audience right now, I won't point him out, he's a business owner, he owns part of a machine shop. It's state of the art. There's eight employees, but they have numerous machines that when they close the door at night, the machines run automatically from a CAD program that these people are engineering every day on the shop floor. Some of these people actually are co-op students it's from Smith. Some of them are recent graduates. Almost all of them are a graduate of the school. And that's just one shop in, in the valley that I can point to. Uh, in my own particular shop at one point in time, I had students training on jet aircraft engine welding. And because they weren't 18 years of age, even though they were certified to weld on it, Delta permitted them to go to work every day and weld on engine parts until they turned 18. So the law is that we have to stay current, we have to stay state-of-the-art in vocational education, and that's what we do. As I said, Germany also offers a brewmaster as a trade, so it's not all about future. Well, well just uh, since you're adding that as an anecdote, a uh, brewmaster is very steady the art, as anybody would know if they've seen what's going on in that field. I know because occasionally I do work in that field, welding work, and I see what they have in in that industry, and it's not the same. It's not the same as you know the old bathtub. <laughs> okay, I have one last question, then we'll go into the, the, uh, the final statements. Um, what do you see as the school's biggest challenge in the years ahead, and how would you propose to tackle that challenge? And I guess we're at scaling. Thank you. Uh, the future is very bright in regards to the environment of Smith's Vocational Agricultural High School. When the students come there and they walk through that door, it's, it's like uh, it's the, the air is just lifted. And it sounds a little melancholy, but I saw the old days. I saw the medium days, and I've seen the new days. And the new days that the kids are showing up early for school. They're coming into their classrooms ahead of the teachers. They're ready to go to work. And the thing is that we need to stay up with the kids. The thing is that they are ready to go to work we have to build this new building for our sciences building. One of the things that I'm good at is public relations, and I am bringing in legislative people to Smith School to introduce them to what we need, how we're going to fund it, and what has to happen. So as excited as the kids are, I'm getting the legislative as excited. They're going to find me the money. They're going to find us the money, and we're going to build that new building. Mr. Cotton? Well, I totally agree with Mr. Kaylan as to what he was saying. The, uh, one of the things we are looking at is increasing what 
the base of what we have. Uh, we have uh, nursing in there. We could add a, a pharmaceutical package to that, uh, ph a pharmacy tech. There's all kinds of ways we can go. It's, we are, as we build the number of students that go there, we will be enlarging these different areas. We, we want to cover as many of these areas with good, qualified people that we can. But the magic words are good, qualified. That's what we produce. So that's what we're trying to do. And there are many different ways of doing that, many different types of uh, hmm. expansions that we can go, uh, and ways we can go. And I, that, the one I used was just uh, one of f a few. Mr. Fitzgerald? I, uh, well, one of the major, uh, uh, to start with, I agree with my uh, fellow trustees that a building program is very important. Uh, several years ago, we did uh, begin the application process for that grant, which would pay 75% of the cost of a new building. Um, as I pointed out before, our, our newest building is 1979. Um, another issue that really hasn't been addressed is that there is a shrinking cohort of school-aged children coming along over the next few years, so it will be uh, very important to make sure that we draw as many new students as we can uh, to expand our programs, to bring more uh, students into the school uh, from a smaller uh, uh, group of uh, of eligible uh, children. And then also I would like to see um, an equine program. I would like to see um, a wetlands program. Uh, it's not like summer camp. It's not like, well, let's do this today. It is a school. It is governed by... Mr. Lynn? Well, in looking at Oliver Smith's vision and the vision that I helped uh, educate David Bourbeau on, when he asked me to be his chair of his election committee, uh, <clears throat> is the idea that this school would be a state-of-the-art school. And it was, in his mind, a, not a secondary school. It was a school for young people. But I see this school as open, being opened up almost 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and running programs utilizing <coughs> the same equipment that the secondary students use during the day so that People in the community, for once and for all, will uh, learn what the school is about, be able to utilize the school, and uh, probably also increase the uh, interest in the school in young age people. And that goes for across the board, all of the, I think it's five counties right now that the school uh, receives students from. I have a student from Beckett. Uh, we've had students from Athol, and I understand now they have students from Worcester County. So there are students that are dedicated to the idea of coming to this particular school, a unique school, and I see this as a way to uh, improve the school. One last thing. I fought maybe 20 years, both in Washington and Boston. I fought with uh, Commissioner Antonucci about funding. I had two students go in front of the general court, and uh, I would like to see us fight for extra funding because this is a national landmark. I'm afraid Mr. Lynn may have jumped to his closing statement. Um, this is the question about challenges, and there are challenges, and then there are well, there are challenges, and then there are challenges. So, um, and what's the biggest challenge? So, what's the biggest anything? We have the challenge of, of working this governance thing out with the mayor of Northampton. He's making a big deal about it. it needs to get resolved right away, so we can go ahead about the business of training people. Um, the big challenge for a vocational school is the big challenge for the economy. Where are the jobs? We train people to go to work right out of high school. And so we need jobs waiting for them when they get out of high school. So either that means we target the right area or we make those jobs grow somehow. That's not something the trustees can do. But that's the really big challenge for a vocational school is where are the jobs for these kids when they graduate. So that is all about money. You see five guys up here who are definitely concerned about this school, who all have the ideas and I think all the abilities to do these things. But it's about getting the money into the school and targeting it the right way. So the big challenge is making that happen so that when somebody graduates from our school, they go to a job, not into a debt-producing college career. Our kids go to work, they can pay for the junior college. Okay, we're going to go into the final stage. <coughs> we have two minutes, and keeping the rotation going, we'll start with Mr. Cotton. Well, 
and I guess I give up my two minutes. I've been uh, there for, for a while. I have been involved with uh, superintendents and since C. Bradley McGrath, and that, that goes back to the 70s. I have a deep love for the school, and I want to see it do well. That's why I'm there. And as long as I can do that, I feel I'm doing my job. What you're looking at up here right now is people that are going to be elected, three of us. Our job is just one thing. It's Smith School. That's what we got to take care of in all things that affect Smith School, namely money, uh, dealing with the city, and so on and so forth. But that's what we do. Our job is to take care of Smith School. Our job is to make sure that we're the, uh, the uh, common core values that the, are given out by the Department of Education are followed. I, I meant to show that. one minute, I'm sorry. He fooled me. He <laughs> threw a sign at me, I thought it said stop. I was trying to Keep going, keep going. Keep going. Uh, but the, uh, we get involved with just about everything. Uh, we get involved with, uh, obviously, with the city. We get involved with the hill towns, we get involved with the state. Uh, that's referring to the, to the new building. Uh, that's our job. We, fortunately, the three people that are there right now, what we do, we all have our own little daily work or, uh, that we specialize in. I haven't faked my mind out yet. I'm still pretty loose at it. But, uh, Mike is a great uh, purveyor of uh, finding people to come and show them what we've got. This guy over here, I think he'd go, he could go and uh, farm it on his own. I'm in the middle. I'm trying to do a little bit of everything. But we do our best. Thank you. Mr. Fitzgerald? Thank you. Um, I would just like to say one size doesn't fit all. And I think Smith School uh, shows that. It's a little school with a big heart and a big mission. Uh, we have many unique institutions in our city. We, we pride ourselves on our many uh, unique and sometimes eccentric uh, institutions. Smith School is one of those. I like to think that as an elected member, I can keep the school out of politics, to simply, as Mr. Cotton, my colleague, says, to work for the school, for the students, for the today, and for the future. Um, when you start throwing politics into the mess, I think a lot of times children get thrown aside. I would just say that it seems that there's enough trouble running one high school without attempting to take over another. Uh, that is essentially paying most of, uh, most of its costs through its own efforts. I think I'll be very honored to be um, chosen by my fellow citizens for another uh, another term, working with the Smith School of Trustees. Thank you. Well, it's an interesting problem, and it's the reason that I'm running. I think it was April 24th, the article in the Gazette uh, brought up this problem that the mayor and the Board of Trustees was having. And it's an interesting dilemma because historically that's the problem with Smith School. And this goes all the way back to 1918 and 1920 when, when uh, then Mayor Calvin Coolidge had to go before the legislature in order to get some kind of control over the school, and he accomplished that. The, uh, the, the legislature decided that uh, both the mayor and the superintendent of the Northampton School would become ex officio trustees, and they were on the board with the full power of the three elected trustees. And the point of all this is very simple. This is a trust. This was a trust given from a will by someone who didn't want his picture taken, didn't have a painting of himself, didn't want a statue, didn't want a plaque. He wanted to give $400,000 to the city of Northampton, and consequently after uh, the death of his nephew, who was in control of that as the executor of his state, uh, that money went on to Austin Smith's sister, Sophia Smith. So you can see what kind of uh, wealth the city of Northampton has inherited from just two people and an enormous amount of money. 
and that money still goes on to this day. The trustees have a very important role. They are the trustees of the will. They have a fiduciary responsibility that I as a trustee will fight to the dying day. Uh, the point here though is this, the mayor and the city are in a quandary and I am looking at this as a win-win situation. I will do everything I can as a trustee to fight for extra funding and also to give the superintendent of the school, I'm a superintendent, certified superintendent, I would give that superintendent all the ability to go out and find the students to fill the, the positions, the seats at that school. And I've talked about this as far as adult education, postgraduate, that's a very important part. This is not just a secondary school, and also as a secondary school. I think if he has the ability to do that, we won't even have a problem with funding. <laughs> so, politics is in this question because there are five people running instead of three. Um, the last several times, there was no opposition. Most people aren't paying attention to Smith vote. I went to, uh, I was in Northampton while my kid went through K-12 here and I didn't know a lot about Smith Folk. And the day I got hired there and walked into the electrical shop and I, my eyes opened up wide and I said, why didn't I do this in high school? And I think more people need to know more about what goes on there every day. When we had uh, the district review last year and they asked a cadre of faculty, does the community know what you do here at Smith Folk? As an open-ended question. And the first real obvious answer to anyone is no, they don't. And if you ask anybody, the answer is no, they don't. But the real second question is, what community? Which community? Because if you look out the front door of Smith Vogue, you're looking at one community, but if you look left, there's two or three more, and if you look right, two or three more, and behind you, some more. There are many, many communities in Northampton itself, and many, many more communities in 20 towns that feed to Smith Vogue. So there is a political question for you. Pick three of us to be the governors of Smith Vogue and to help this superintendent. But there's a whole lot of constituency that aren't represented at all, and I think maybe that could be changed. Maybe that meaningfully would be changed to resolve David's problem, to resolve Jeff's problem by a regional vocational district, and I'd kind of like to see that happen. But we've mentioned David Bourbeau, we've mentioned Oliver Smith, now we've mentioned Calvin Coolidge. Possibly Calvin Coolidge's work is done, and we can go back to doing Oliver Smith and David Bourbeau's work of having a really forward-looking, experimental farm, supporting a farm, with all of the shops that are meaningful to move future into workplace for students. Um, Mr. Kelly, <clears throat> I want to thank you all for inviting me here this evening. Um, my wife talked about our children and the education that they've received and how they grew up in Northampton, were educated in Northampton schools, went on to higher education, and all have careers today. I walk into Smith School and I look at a list of colleges that are posted on our wall where our students have the opportunity to go on. And if that's what they choose to do. I watch young ladies and gentlemen that work with their heads and their hands and they turn around and if they decide not to go into the trade immediately and they want to go on to a two-year or four-year college, when they walk out of there between the education they had at Smith School, the education they had at whatever college they choose, uh, they have an opportunity to go right into a management situation to earn sixty or $70,000 at a young age. So we're providing an opportunity here in the city of Northampton. We're providing an opportunity for these students to achieve what they want to achieve. They want to achieve not necessarily, I've heard parents say, boy, you know, I really didn't want my kid to go to Smith School, but he said that's what he wanted to do. And today, he makes more money than I do. But it turned around where it's the graduation when I was on stage at John McGreen Hall this past year, and those students skipped, they did flips, they had balloons, they blew horns, and they were proud to graduate from Smith's Vocational Agricultural High School. And I'm proud to serve that school as a trustee. I have my business cards in my pocket all the time. I'm out there working on a regular basis with not only the local people of Northampton, but up in the hill towns, and now that Pittsfield and the, the lines have all drawn, they turn around and they are now coming. Ben Dowling's representative is coming into Williamsburg. I have an opportunity to, to tell my story to a whole bunch of new people, and I'm proud of it. Thank you. I think we all have a round of applause for our five <laughs> They exit.
exit the stage, we're going to give our uncontested council candidate from Ward 3, Ryan O'Donnell, an opportunity to speak for five minutes and address the group. So. take any more than an hour. Can, can you hear me like this? Or? Can you hear me now? Okay. Thanks, you too. Um, well, thank you very much. My name is Ryan O'Donnell. I'm, I'm running for Ward 3 City Council. And like uh, the other candidates before me, I want to thank the Ward 3 Neighborhood Association and Jerry Butker and everyone else who organized this, and thanks to all of you for being here today. And I guess I'd start like this. I uh, started running in April, and since that time, I've knocked on uh, literally hundreds and hundreds of doors, and some more, than, some more than once. And this process has been really enormously rewarding for me. It's been uh, an enriching, um, educational experience to go and do this kind of, have this kind of conversation with so many people. And I don't know any other way, actually, to get to know uh, the issues that affect Ward 3 other than doing that. And I also think it's important because, as you know, Ward 3 is a tremendously diverse ward. Uh, we have downtown, we have the meadows, we have all the way down to the island, we have Salvo House and Cahill Apartments, and what I'd like to say is that every single person in Ward 3 deserves good representation, and that's my goal getting into this. Also from these conversations, one thing that I have learned and really take to heart is that uh, there really is a tremendous amount that we all agree on despite these differences. And for example, um, we all want a responsive city government. Uh, we all believe in making uh, sound investments in our schools, in certain infrastructure like our roads, and that this investment ought to be made um, equitably throughout the city, and certainly in Ward 3. Um, I think many of us believe that, in general, the financial burden in our society ought not to fall on those who can least afford it, uh, middle-income families and, and the poor. And I'm a supporter of a progressive tax code at the state level and anything we can do in that spirit here in the city of Northampton. Now, there's going to be a lot of, a lot of things, as, you, as you've just heard, that we don't agree on. And when we come to issues like that, what I would suggest is important is you look for a counselor who, um, number one, can get into the policy details of the issue at hand, and you can have confidence that he or she can do a good job navigating through that. Two, that you have a counselor who genuinely, genuinely wants to listen to all sides of a debate and will listen to you and show you that respect even if we disagree on an issue. And three, a counselor who's going to do the job and from time to time um, work on issues for which there are no good solutions and make decisions that aren't pleasant to make. So that's the kind of counselor I want to be. Uh, I'm running for Ward 3 to represent every single part of the ward. And I look forward to the opportunity to, to work with everyone because I think that when we recognize what we do agree on, we can come to a, a common sense of purpose about many things. And I look forward to January when a new council convenes with a common sense of purpose. I think when Ward 3 uh, works together, we've shown that we can accomplish a great deal. And I look forward to being part of that process with you. I don't get any questions today, do I? But I am here, and if you want to talk uh, after this forum, I'm more than happy to do that. Thank you. Um, Bill, Jesse?
We have the, the three, two of the three candidates for a counselor at larger here. Uh, the third candidate, Anthony Patillo, was contacted twice and invited to attend and both times declined the invitation. So I just want to be clear that we did extend the hand and it was his decision not to participate. But we're very happy to have Jesse Adams and Bill Dwight uh, with us. And uh, uh, I feel like, you know, stick them on the Barbie and let's grill them, huh? <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> We're going to start off. Each gets a two-minute introductory statement. So uh, doing this alphabetically, we'll start with Jesse. I'm Jesse Adams. I live on Main Street. I'm an attorney with a law office also on Main Street. I'm an at-large city councilor and the city council vice president. I have been honored to serve in the council for the past four years and would like the opportunity to continue to do so. When I ran four years ago, I talked about the things that I thought were important, things like openness in government, responsiveness, and fiscal oversight. I am here tonight to discuss the issues that impact your lives and to ask for one of your two votes for city councilor at large. I was one who led the charge for the much needed new city charter that passed overwhelmingly last November, which has led to better overall government. I've rewritten the city council rules and the entire committee system in an effort to make the council more efficient and to provide better oversight of government functions. I drafted an ordinance that requires every decision-making body to have an open public comment period at the beginning of each meeting. My law now assures that every citizen has a right to be heard and speak to the issues that affect them before important decisions are made. It's a step forward for open, accessible government and best practices. I drafted a public art ordinance which will mandate greater public participation and oversight of public art, and I believe it will lead to high quality public art in this city. Also last month was the third annual Northampton Jazz Festival, which I am a co-founder and board member. I've supported changes in zoning that allow property owners to have more flexibility with their property and allow for a more affordable housing units. I sponsored a key amendment that along with an amendment from the current Ward 3 Councilor created additional requirements for larger developments that will safeguard neighborhoods and allow them to keep their character while fostering new growth to expand our tax base and bringing new much needed revenue. My zoning amendment came from the concerns of residents based primarily in Ward 3. I listened to you, I heard you, and I acted. And my amendment protects you. I got it done. If re-elected, I will continue with my hard work and I will get, I will get results for you. Uh, Mr. Dwight? Um, I'm Bill Dwight. I'm uh, city councilor at large. Um, and, and, and actually, let me, let me start over. I want to thank you, Jerry, and, and thank the Ward 3 Neighborhood Association, which, of course, um, I should point out, this is the only forum in which uh, uh, Councilor Adams and I even get to talk, and, and, and I really appreciate the opportunity to do that, even though the first pitch of the World Series is being thrown right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, well, case or us or us. I am Bill Dwight. I am the city council president because uh, my colleagues were kind enough to um, sign me up for that. Now, at first, when I actually was chosen city council president, I did it with marked reluctance. Um, and I've since come to really appreciate it, in large part due to the fact, as Councilor Adams uh, talked about, the, the charter reform that was put into place. And that actually is going to speak in large part to my reasons for wanting to continue to serve and why I think the, uh, my position so far has had some value. It's inclusion, and it is a distinct demarcation of the division of powers. And as council president, I became, I very much appreciated the process of deliberation and the development of polity that we participated in, and it was a learning process that I'm very proud to have experienced. I want to continue in that respect because I think when we talk about public service, we frequently forget the public part. And that is, we usually talk in terms of you and us. And I would much prefer, and I think we're moving in the direction of speaking about we, we collectively, how we participate and how we contribute to our own destinies. And I would like to continue to facilitate that process and I hope that you'll consider giving me one of your two votes come November 5th. Thank you. Okay, first question, we'll start with uh, Councilor Dwight. Over the past few days, I've spoken with a number of residents who have expressed surprise and some concern about what seems to be dissension within the Northampton Police Department. In your opinion, 
are there problems in that department that need attention? And if so, what do you think needs to be done to rectify them? Well, I mean, uh, once again, this goes back to the charter. And, and Councilor Adams and Councilor Freeman Daniels and I have had a number of discussions about this. The Division of Powers, of course, puts the executive in charge of departmental issues in large part. The, the influence that we bring to bear is that we are just as you are, we're citizens. We don't have authority over the police department, although we certainly do have influence at contract time. We have influence at budgetary time. That said, it doesn't mean that we're excused from being concerned. I am right now, given the way this is broken out, which I have to say I'm kind of disappointed the way it's proceeded, but <coughs> all things being equal, I would much prefer to see that we allow the process to go forward with an investigation that's being conducted by the, the district attorney in Hammond County, and then proceed if there are policy violations within the, within, uh, the police department, those be addressed by the city's HR and human resources department and by the police chief. It is a professional organization and well run by my reckoning. And I think, I honestly, without, you know, this, uh, you would expect this from a politician talking about the city, I do honestly believe that we have one of the finest police departments you're going to find anywhere. And I think that you'll, you'll see this kind of discord in virtually every department uh, in any business or enterprise anyone's that ever been associated with probably experienced some level of this. But if, even if it's reached the threshold of policy violation and reached the threshold of a crime, then there's a different, then there's a different way to address that. And I, I have every confidence that we will. I'm the chair of public safety, and um, I take this matter very seriously. And I don't believe for one second that the quality of service will be affected while this matter gets resolved. Um, and I also respect very much labor in general. Um, but I also do agree that there is an investigation underway with the district attorney from Hennon County, and we need to see what comes of that before uh, we can really know what will happen. And I also believe that, um, I do believe the mayor will handle the situation effectively. And the reason why I say that is because um, the mayor has dealt with other departments who have had issues appropriately. I'm referring to um, specifically the parking department. Uh, there were some issues there a few years ago, and the mayor dealt with it effectively and decisively. So um, I have faith in the mayor that he will deal with it appropriately, and I do agree with the council president that if there are policy violations, uh, and of course if there are crimes, that they need to be dealt with appropriately as well. Okay, second question, and uh, Council Adams will let you start first. Uh, should Smith Vocational High School merge with the Northampton Public School System? Is it a yes or no and why? Well, I, I believe that one of the things we need to do as a government is look to um, regionalization and combining services uh, with other entities, other areas, other communities. And similarly with this situation, um, I, I, I will consider it. But here's what I want to consider. I support merging services only when there is no um, noticeable decline in services after the merger. And I support services that save taxpayer money. Certainly the proposal will save taxpayer money. So in order to convince me that it is a good idea, I will need to be demonstrated very clearly and by a pretty high standard that, the, that any proposed merger will not affect the quality and level of education because it really is all about the students. Thank you. It is indeed a unique asset, and, and in fact, woefully underappreciated in the community. And to uh, Denny Wolf's point, I, I actually agree with virtually everything he said, with one exception. He said the mayor wants to get his money back. It's not the mayor's money, it's our money. And in, the mayor is charged with presiding over that money. The discussion, I'm glad <coughs> is engaged. I'm glad we're actually talking about this for two reasons. One, it actually raises the profile of Smith Vocation. You see that actually people are talking about it and having more attention and paying more attention to it. But more importantly, it's a fiscal issue. It is a fiscal issue. When you get down to it, um, we are unique, as everyone continued to point out, with two uh, school districts in the community. It is a trust. It is unique in every feature. And that's very much to the good, by and large. But with redundancy of some services, it needs to be addressed or at least understood. 
when you have replications of, of uh, finance oversight, when you have replication of human resource development, <laughs> and things of that nature, it is not inappropriate to discuss that. And at the same time, just as Councilor Adams said, and I don't think, and I don't think there's a single person who would who would disagree with this premise that we <coughs> need to sustain and help promote the expansion and amplification of Smith Vocational to our credit, to the community's credit. But at the same time, we can't do it and pretend it doesn't exist, that it doesn't have a potential dilatorious impact on our own larger school system and our own larger budget. <coughs> and 53% of the budget goes to school. <coughs> so I'm really actually anxious to see an expanded conversation and discussion and taking in and reviewing what it is, what Smith Vocational means to us, and point and what we in turn mean back to Smith Vocational. Okay. Um, one of the byproducts, or perhaps unintended consequences, of Northampton's recent development is the apparent inability of many long-term residents to continue to afford living here. Do you see this as a problem? And what would you propose the city do to help stop this outflow? I'm, I'm, I'm it, yeah, it is a problem. I mean, it is a problem, and it's a problem actually that's borne by success in some level. The part of the <laughs> part of the appeal of Northampton is well, I mean, that's part of that's the problem. The appeal of Northampton, which is very high. Consequently, there's a desire to move here. Many people chose to live here, which is unique to a lot of communities. I've lived in and grown up in some communities. That's not the choice. Most people are looking for a way out. Many people are looking for a way to get in and or stay. And consequently, it creates this competitive push that literally does impact people who have devoted their entire lives to this community and suddenly have to take stock and look and see if they can actually afford to continue to live here, while at the same time living in an asset that's been established by, the val by other people valuing their homes. And part, part of this goes to what Ryan mentioned, which is not something that's just limited here, but it's the development of, progr of a progressive tax system that taxes you based on your wealth and, not, and on your ability to pay, and not how someone values your property. We in the state have abdicated from uh, collecting money from people, from corporations and from wealthy people, talking about cutting the income tax, and it's, all the services are still needed. They're all still the demand. And it's been deferred to towns and municipalities to make up the difference with property taxes, which is a regressive tax. It's not based on your ability to pay. And it threatens the lives and livelihood of, of people that we need to be part of this community because they contribute to this community. And we could be next, and when I say we, I'm very close to next, of being priced out of the city of Northampton. And we, I, I know that the council is committed to making sure that doesn't happen. Affordability is, in my opinion, the biggest issue in the city. What we can do about it is two things. We need to create new revenues that are not based um, solely on residential taxes, and we need to look for savings to make the cost of, of running our government um, less expensive. When expanding the tax base, we need to do that both residentially and commercially. I've supported, um, I've supported zoning laws, for example, that, are, that have successfully brought in new businesses. Um, also, a couple other things we can do to that effect. We can lobby the state to see if it's possible for us to keep more of our meals tax money right back here at home. Also, we can turn our landfill into a solar facility, making um, money and generating money from that. As far as looking for savings, energy efficiencies are a great way to save. Energy efficiencies are socially responsible and they save taxpayers money. For example, ESCOs. We hire private companies to come in and find savings, um, and then they get paid from those savings. And another thing is I, I did already address the regionalization and, and combining, um, combining our resources with other municipalities and communities, but again, only if that, in combining those services, we put out the same good services and, um, and <clears throat> we can save money and maintain the same level of service in that way. Uh, questions from the audience? 
Fred? Uh, Fred Zubnak, Ward 3, and uh, I've been following the uh, Stormwater uh, Enterprise Fund. And uh, in the process of doing that, <coughs> I said, well, we have two enterprise funds, water and sewer. So um, if you go to the assessor's office, the rates from 1997 to present for water and sewer are listed on a wall. If you look carefully at those numbers, uh, they increase about 6 or 7% per year. Uh, so then my mind went to the Stormwater Enterprise Fund. <coughs> my understanding in that case, the rates will be uh, approved by the city council. And my question is, how is the city council going to vet those rates? How are you going to inspect them to make sure that the rates aren't too high? Fred, I've been working very hard on this issue, and you, you and I have actually discussed the matter. To answer your question specifically, the Board of Public Works is going to present to us before they ask us to vote on the rate exactly why the, what the rate is, why it's that way, and what the money will be going to. But also to address your concerns about um, how can we contain this from being like the water and sewer rate, this is how. Uh, two ways, really. One thing is that I have drafted an amendment that I have presented already, and it's out there for consideration. Actually, I showed it to you, okay. and then that's to create a permanent cap on it. The current legislation has a temporary cap for five years. My uh, amendment that I've already drafted and proposed has a cap permanently. That's what I'm proposing, and that's how we're going to protect the residents, if it passes, from it being like the water and sewer rates, from having those rates go up exponentially, as you've seen on that wall. I was concerned about that from, from the moment I heard about this, and I've acted on it. Um, another way that it's, it's important to also know that this is not similar to the, it's, it's, it's not similar to the um, water and sewer rates because it, this has an exemption for people who are um, doing poorly financially, and that's extremely important and, and makes it more fair and more equitable. So I'm proposing a cap to prevent it from being like the water and sewer fees. And I'm working very hard on this issue, and we're also working to ensure that there's as much public process as, as possible on it. And the council president has worked with us, too, as well on this. And, um, and those are the ways that we're going we're gonna to safeguard the ratepayers from this fee getting out of control. And I, I would add to that, since we're going to tag team on this, I think. Um, there is also a built-in, now, this is a unique fee, and an important fact, actually, this is part of my frustration, because with Proposition 2.5, as we continue to advocate funding things through taxation. We came up with alternatives and came up with enterprise funds that are fee devoted. And the bad, the downside to that, of course, is, and you mentioned this as well, is the fact that there is the representation, the distance from representation is much bigger. You have an appointed board that has oversight. We are pushing and we have been pushing. And in fact, this is unique in many respects. Uh, we have Pulled, we have pulled the sense of the Board of Public Works out in the public, and we've had as much authority of, uh, on this issue as we can have at this point constitutionally, and we'll probably hopefully go further. The other issue is one of the things that one of the savings would be uh, mitigation fees. If you are able to address the runoff on your property, that you can offset uh, your 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 charges. One of the frustrating things with this, Fred, as you know, is that water and sewer, you can actually calculate what it is you're contributing or taking from the system. This is a charge for being rained on. But point in fact is the real, but the real pressure comes from the fact there is no other way, at least so far that we can see, to subsidize to our, our, the system that we have put in place to protect ourselves from flooding and from water damage. So we are, actually I'm quite pleased with the level of discussion that we're having and that we will continue to have on this one particular enterprise fund, which as I said is unique. It's not, it didn't happen with the storm, it didn't happen with sewage, and it didn't happen with water. It is now happening with this. Thank you. This is a question that was submitted by Mr. Zidnak to me before the so, so he's monopolizing all the questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. The mayor is creating an elected official compensation advisory board. The new body is tasked with studying both the adequacy and equity of compensation, benefits, and expense allowances of municipal elected officials and report its findings and recommendations to the mayor and city council, end of quote. 
what is the current compensation, benefits, and expense allowances for city councilor? As city councilors, what do you think would be fair in the future? Well, first of all, it's, the mayor is doing this by charge of charter. Just, it's not this is something that the mayor just sort of randomly decided to do. Um, and this is always, you know, how much do you think you're worth if you're working as a counselor? I, for one, have always advocated uh, that we should be paid a very small stipend. The, the reason being this should hardly be a position that people want to retain because it's paying them well. So far, rock solid success. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the fact is, is that it's been at $5,000 a year. This is a, councils make $5,000 a year. I get a $500 bump as council president, which has kept me in salads. The, 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 uh, that is our annual stipend. Um, when I was an hourly wage earner, it was a net loss for me. Because actually, I, when I would have to take time off from work, I lost pay. And I've never cried poor because of this. I think I would defer to the committee because I don't think that I would offer a, a, a good perspective on that issue. I, but I think I personally would love to see a sliding scale because part of the problem is is that the only people who can run for office are people who can afford to be in office. We aren't going to get a single mother who is working two jobs to be able to run for office. We're, not, we're only going to hear from her from the outside. We're not going to hear from her on the inside. That's frustrating. Um, you, consequently, you get a lot of people who tend to run for office who are, don't have jobs, who are, who are retired. And that shouldn't be either. So, and we do get insurance. So that, I, by the way, I should have mentioned that as part of our, part of our package, we have access to health insurance which can come out to in, for in some cases close to $20,000. Um, so, and that's unfortunately not fair because counselors who don't take that package are not compensated as a result. So it's, I'm, I'm grateful for the, the existence of that committee and will abide by their choice. Um, $5,000, I would likely defer to the committee, but frankly, um, I wouldn't, I would hope that it wouldn't be raised much, if at all. And the reason why is because, it's not because we don't do a lot of work. We do a tremendous amount of work. From correspondences with the people that we represent, to actual meetings, to drafting legislation, to uh, you, know, you name it. We, we're going to events. Uh, we, we put a tremendous amount of time into this. Each and every counselor puts a tremendous amount of time into this. But I would rather see other departments get raises before us. I'd rather see teachers and, and, and public safety and, and all other departments get raises before us. Because I do believe that we do it because it's, it's almost volunteer work, not quite. We get 5,000, that's not nothing. But, but when you think about the amount of effort and work we put into it, it seems like it's volunteer. But at the same time, I think that if anybody should get a raise, we should be the last ones to get one. Question from the audience? Uh, Jason Foster, running for City Council for Ward 2. Both of you have expressed concern for the um, increased expenses in the city of Northampton and how you may be pricing yourself out of the market if in terms of affordability. What revenue generating ideas do you have that are not tax dependent or the hope of more state aid to help our city generate income? Um, a point of clarification, Jason, you mean revenue generation by the city that would bring in money into the coffers beyond taxation, fines, and fees? Yes. We are constitutionally precluded from doing, engaging in any enterprise that would do that. Part of the problem, part of our frustration, of course, is the fact that constitutionally we're precluded from running a deficit and a debt. State's not so encumbered. Certainly the national government is. <laughs> the we um, at the same time we are very limited in how we generate revenue. That's why you often hear people talk about growth because growth basically means tax generation. But blind growth is not an asset. Sometimes it actually has a dilatorious impact on the community and its ability to function. That is the frustration of a councilor and of a mayor and of every municipal system. Because this is the point, all the dysfunction you see in D.C. Is a, is a product of politicking. 
And where the governance happens is right at this very level, and this is part of our frustration. This is where it happens. We're the most elemental form of governance. And we are handcuffed and constrained any number of ways. With growing commitment, uh, lessening commitments from the state, growing fixed costs, and at the same time trying to, what we're trying to do is tap a very limited resource, which is the community. And so I would love the opportunity and the means to generate money beyond, you know, neighborhood groups raising money to buy pens for schools. I would love to, you know, convert something into a Ferris wheel and make money for the city. But we can't. We're not allowed to. And that is our eternal frustration. As I've stated before, I think one of the things we need to do is continue to expand the tax base so that we have new people and entities paying in, both residentially and commercially. And right now, fortunately, there's an awful lot of commercial activity going on uh, in our city. And th that's one thing we need to con continue to do. Um, I, I, su I support all of uh, that effort. Um, payment in lieu of taxes. We need to go to the nonprofits who, by Massachusetts general laws, don't pay taxes or some may pay in a little bit, but none are man mandated to do so, and create a program where, where we go to them and request that they contribute more because they don't have to pay taxes. And there are other good models out there. A lot of other communities have done it. Um, I have actually sat down with the mayor and another citizen who believed in this sort of initiative and asked if we can get going on this sort of program. With Smith, they do have a small pilot program, but um, I asked the mayor if we could do a, a, a request, sit down with them and see if they'd be willing to do a larger one. And I know he wants to, I believe he wants to wait until the, the new president is in, now the new president's in, so I'm expecting that to go forward and I'll continue to work towards that as I have been. Um, also, I, as I stated earlier, another way for, to, to uh, another thing we have to think about is how to save money, um, how to make the government cost less if possible. And I've already addressed regionalization. That's something that we need to continue to do. I support those efforts. Also, the closed landfill, turning that into a solar facility or energy park, as you've suggested, um, and others have suggested. I, su I, I support all of those things. And again, also energy efficiencies. ESCO companies, I've supported those and I'll continue to do that. And I'm open-minded to any sorts of new revenue forms that any, any of my constituents have. I'd love to hear it about it at any point. Thank you. Um. President Reckman has asked that we try to be out of here by quarter of nine. So I'm going to ask one last question and we'll go into final statement. Is that okay? Sure. Um, what do you feel will be the city's biggest challenge <coughs> over the next two years and how would you propose to tackle this issue? Who's first? Jesse. Uh, again, I mean, the, 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 I believe the biggest issue is maintaining city services versus affordability. And the reason why I say versus is because it would be nice if they, if they didn't clash, but they certainly do. Um, so I'm extreme, extremely concerned about affordability. I'm concerned about people who, who live here, who grew up here, who can't afford to live here any, more, any longer. I'm concerned about people who have moved away and would like to come back but can't. And I'm, I'm concerned also about commercial affordability and ensuring that our businesses um, stay here and that new ones come. So um, that's one challenge and also making government uh, more efficient. And I've already addressed some of, of those, uh, some of the ways we can do that. So I'll, I'll see you the rest of my time. The, um, actually, the one thing that will be an issue, that was an issue two years ago and four years ago, and it is an issue tonight, <coughs> that we're making progress on is transparency and access to the municipal government. And to that end, we have been working very hard on that point and still there is work to be done. But that also requires participation from the public. And part of the frustration for me has been, while at the same time we expand transparency, we are not seeing a compensatory response from the community in some respect, which is where we need, we need we're all pulling the oars. We're all, <laughs> it's not just, you know, elect me and have me fix the problems. It's, this is something that we experience collectively. It's, and, and I think that is part of the ongoing challenge. And actually to Jason's point and, and what Councillor Adams said, one of, one of my pie in the sky, which I hope is not pie in the sky, revenue generation system is a regional municipal broadband system. 
that I would love to see start, and we've already, we've, we're exploring the prospect of that, is establishing municipal broadband with a gig <coughs> up and a gig down that they can get in Belarus and we can't get here. And that's because we've sanctioned monopolies with Comcast and they throttle it and charge you according to increased download speed. We make it a municipal service. We get the revenue and we share it regionally with East Hampton, Holyoke, Amherst, and, and any other town that wants to sign in. Also gives us a little power and a little leverage with a corporation that's very wealthy that puts up a lot of resistance. But that actually then brings in and invites in new development technologies because access, broad access to the internet is huge. And that would offset some of the tax bumps that, that discourages other uh, places from trying to move to areas that, that, you know, otherwise might be appealing. And we are enormously appealing. We've discovered that. And at the same time, good, give, provide good green, green jobs that pay well, plus fill municipal coffers. So to that end, oh, stop. Thank you. Um, would like to just thank both of the candidates here. I think they deserve a round of applause. That concludes our forum. And President Bob, I got uh, thought of your five minutes earlier than you requested. Well, that was our final